if any of you know me, and there's a few familiar names on the on the attendees list, you'll know that um, I've had an interest in publication bias for a long time. And in fact, I hadn't done that much work in it recently, and I thought my work in the area might have been done. Um, but somebody called Brett Dolman, who's a very savvy clinician just up the road from where I live, who lives in Nottingham and works in Nottingham, uh, came to me uh, with a large systematic review um, considering uh, treatments for post-operative pain relief. Uh, and as you can see, it's 339 trials uh, and comparing nine different analgesics to placebo and a series of pairwise meta-analyses. Uh, and if people don't know about pain trials, one thing we're taught about um, is that there's a lot of subjectivity in pain measurements. The trials often have quite an objective measure um, that seems to be common usage and it makes sense. Uh, my understanding of pain management is that morphine is about the most powerful thing you can give, but it also has side effects and you don't want to give more morphine than you have to. So it's a bit of a rescue medication. So what generally happens um, is uh, morphine is administered only as necessary after other uh, drugs have been given to try and relieve as much pain as possible without giving the morphine. So the outcome is often how much less morphine is used uh, or the difference in the morphine used in the, in the arms of the trials um, when comparing treatments. So we're not onto pain scales and ratings, we're onto milligrams of morphine difference between arms uh, in this data. So, um, Suzanne has given you a crash course in ways to detect publication bias uh, via funnel plots and associated methods. Um, here are the plot of those 300 and odd trials for the nine different treatments, one for each funnel plot. Uh, please just ignore the different um, symbols and they're key at the moment. We just, just consider each dot uh, on these to, to represent the trial. And I'm hoping, there's something I didn't check, I'm, I'm hoping people can see my, uh, my mouse because uh, that might just be a bit helpful. Uh, yes, yeah, let's go to we can, see it. we can see that. Yes, thank you very much. Great. Okay, um, if, if I'm in this top right hand corner, I forget exactly which treatment it is. This is, but it's probably the most extreme example. We can see thing, see a funnel plot that um, I think by any of our standards we wouldn't say is symmetrical uh, on, along the vertical axis. What we have is that generally the less precise studies towards the bottom of the plot but generally have larger treatment effects. And there could be a concern that these are small studies that have been selectively reported and there are counterpart studies over here that don't exist, oh, sorry, that exist and haven't been published or identified in including the synthesis. And therefore, a, a, a meta-analysis of this data would produce a biased result. Okay, so uh, fortunately, Brad, uh, sorry, Brett, I should say, was a, was a savvy clinician who already thought something was a bit of foot here because it would look that uh, there's some really extreme concerns with publication bias in this literature. Uh, and there is more to the story than that. And I will try and unpick this, uh, which is part of the message I think the talk wants to give. Okay, so um, I'm going to introduce this concept now that it's called baseline risk, uh, we call it baseline risk, and it's a, it's, a, it's a dreadful name for something because baseline risk means different things to different people, even in a technical term. Um, baseline rate, uh, I think the way we're using it is the average risk of a patient to experience the outcome of interest if they have not been treated. Uh, we often talk about it in terms of uh, a binary outcome, experience an event. What we're talking about here is simply the response in the control group. And our kind of working hypothesis or Brett's working hypothesis was that trials with a greater outcome in the control group offer greater potential for larger absolute reductions in the outcome. Um, and if we look across here at this scatter plot, what we have is a, a plot here of the, the mean difference uh, here we've got them to stay in hospital in this example, but it's, it's, it's the same uh, principle. Uh, and this was another outcome we looked at. And you've got control group event rate uh, or, or, um, uh, along the bottom. And um, we can see there seems to be some trend 
And what we're saying is, the more, the, if you like, the more ill or the, the, the larger your outcome is under the control treatment, the more propensity there is for the treatment to work. And therefore, it doesn't look like there's a constant difference in the mean stay of day. The mean stay in day in this case, and not to give too much away in, in, in the examples we're looking at, the mean uh, reduction in uh, morphine is related to how much morphine you would be expected to take if you weren't on an active treatment. My daft example in a very non-technical setting, I don't know if this helps, but I'm going to digress anyway. I'm getting to that age where I'm allowed to digress into uh, slightly uh, relevant examples is um, people whinge. Do you, if you did cross country at school and you all do your cross country the first time, you get a time. And then the teacher says, right, next week, well done everyone last week. You've all got to knock, try and knock a minute off that time. Now, the people that were conscientious the first week have belted it around the course, and there's no way physically possible they can knock a minute off their time. Those that had a wander around and possibly went to the sweet shop, or even worse, went to the news agent shop and bought some cigarettes and sat on the wall for a while and had a smoke before sauntering back to school, very easy for them to knock a minute off. That's an act. Everyone was asked to knock the same amount off. That's an absolute difference that was demanded. If we'd said, okay, everyone has to knock 5% off their time. That would mean that the person that's run around very quickly in absolute terms has to knock less off than the people that sauntered around and that they would have to knock more time off. And this is this kind of difference here. Is it an, are we talking about absolute differences, an absolute amount of morphine? Are we talking about um, a relative amount of percentage reduction? And it looks, well, I'll go to the next slide. And It looks here, if we look for these nine drugs, there's a very strong trend going on here, um, particularly in some of them, that the amount of morphine consumed in the control group, which is along the x-axis, is, is a predictor of the reduction. I, if, you, if the control group is consuming a lot of morphine, the chances are that that trial would observe a bigger treatment effect. And if you can see, there's some very um, large uh, and pretty certain slopes in some of these. We've got a lot of data here. And we talk about this as a, um, a baseline risk interaction with the treatment effect. And I will sometimes be a little bit slack on the slides and talking a baseline risk uh, treat, treatment interactions are just saying the effect of baseline risk or a baseline risk effect. Please bear with me with that, that's what we mean. There's an interaction between baseline risk and treatment. And then we go back to our test and think, well, if we've got this going on in the background, how is that affecting what we're doing about assessing publication bias? We know that this baseline risk interaction issue now, we also have another problem that's slightly subtler, but I think you'll be able to understand. Studies with higher baseline risks will have larger standard deviations. This is just the nature of data. If you're dealing with bigger numbers, the variability between bigger numbers gives you a larger variance than variability in smaller numbers. And therefore, uh, if that happens, then and we're dividing by root n to get a standard error, then uh, standard errors will on average be larger in the studies where larger treatment effects are observed. And that's just the, the way numbers behave. So what really that says is that if we look at studies on a funnel plot and they observed a large difference, a large treatment difference, we would expect on average their standard errors to also be larger. So what we'd expect is a, um, a trend on a funnel plot. So if we go back to the plots I showed you before, what I'm saying is if studies have got a large treatment effect, i.e. they're to the left of the plot, and um, that would mean on average they, they would have also larger standard errors because there's a natural correlation between the, these two um, quantities, the standard error and the mean difference. 
And if there's a naturally induced correlation here, what we're saying is when there's baseline risk interactions, we would naturally expect to get a funnel that is asymmetrical and is manifesting itself as potentially looking like publication bias. Uh, and if that, to, to help you understand that, uh, we've just categorized for illustration that levels of morphine consumption in the control group is less than 20, by a small amount, 20 to 50, and greater than 50 by the blue circles, red triangles and green squares. And if we pick again, because it's probably the most extreme example, the top right hand corner, we see here that um, we have studies, studies with the greatest morphine consumption of generally lower down on the funnel, larger standard errors and larger treatment effects. So what we are, the concern uh, Brett had was that this isn't the dreadful publication bias that we would observe if we just interpret these funnel plots at face value, but it's something to do with baseline risk. And uh, so essentially, and I can say this in a line and I'll go into the details and I, I'm going to skip over the details relatively lightly because it's the principle that matters. We want to do that meta regression first. We want to take out the effect of baseline risk interactions with treatment effects and, and remove that effect before um, we consider if there's uh, asymmetry in the funnels. Only after that will we look at the the, the funnel plots and we plot the residuals of the regression, i.e. after having taken out the effect of baseline risk rather than the observed effects and do an Eggers type test on, on that. Uh, and that's really what we're about. And if people want the nitty gritty of, of the data and the paper was uh, is available for this, we'll give the reference later. So I'm going to skip over this basically, but um, we're going to do a regression like an Eggers test type regression. Um, no, sorry, a regression like adjusting for baseline risk first, and taking the residuals from that, and then doing an Eggers type regression on that. And we looked at three different, basically, flavors of that, uh, looking at uh, just slightly different predictors, whether it was standard error or sample size uh, as the predictor on that, or inverse sample size. And just to give you a notion of what, um, what happens if we take in one of those drugs. Uh, we've taken off the symbols here for different levels of baseline risk. On the right hand side, we have the, the plot that you've seen before as one of those nine plots. In the, if we then plot the residuals in the new approach here using the inverse sample size, we, we, we essentially take all, the, all that excess asymmetry out of the plot. Uh, so um, here we have it again for, for those examples. And um, as you can see, the p-values are much less extreme on the residuals than they are on Agus tests. Some of them are still, if you want to be 5% about that, they're that still concerning, uh, but on average, the trends are less. And in here we have uh, the original analysis on the red and, and the adjusted on the blues. You can see here, there's still a concerning trend even after adjustment where um, on some of these others like here, uh, it, it's not, and here uh, a lot of the trend goes. So I'm going to pause again uh, and pass, uh, while Susan, pass the control back to Suzanne, and please ask any questions at this point if there's anything you can clarify. So, so Alex, there have been a couple of questions, um, points of clarification. Can you see the questions on your web? I will go to them now. Uh, so Abdul was asking um, how how about uh, so the asymmetry in the funnel plot may not always represent publication bias. How do you know it's due to publication bias or not? Uh, uh, well, yeah, and Susan did chip in here. I mean, this is always the um, the million dollar question, really. Um, people, um, when I worked in this area um, before people started using the term small study effects as being more accurate because all you're saying, what that really meant was small studies were observed to have larger treatment effects and that negated the need to give a cause for it. That was, and that, you can kind of see that on a funnel plot and that's non-negotiable. What, what is then open to debate is what is causing the asymmetry and I think this is where the million dollar question is and um, myself and others 
uh, have been criticised in the past for being too immediate in saying asymmetry equals publication bias. And I think the truth's often somewhere in, in, in between. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. The contours that Suzanne showed help, I think, because we haven't really focused on those in this talk, but um, they help. The, the, the way they help is you say, well, where would the studies be missing? If you can imagine where the, where the gap is, and is that in the statistically non-significant areas, and that's the kind of white area on the contour enhanced funnel plots. And I think that goes some way to kind of, if, if it looks like they're all missing in the, in the area with non-significance, I think it adds credence to the fact it could be a publication bias mechanism, certainly not a guarantee. And this is why I think it's, a good, it's really feeding, this is why we need talks like this, if you like, because there are, it can be misleading. And I think all you can do is, is, is use as much now um, uh, and thought and, and caution as possible, but just ignoring the facts and saying, I think whether there's asymmetry by any cause or not, the pooled summary result um, is probably not a very sensible summary of anything you can define because what you're saying is the treatment effect is a function of the size of the study and how that relates to real practice rolled out um, in, in clinical practice, I think is a difficult thing to summarize. Okay. Um, and, and Chris Tate had asked earlier on um, about a point of clarification about one of the, the plots that you presented. It was um, the control group length of stay. So the scale went, included minus five days. Oh, I must admit that I have to uh, uh, be caught out. I hope I haven't labelled that wrongly. Uh, let me see if I can get back to it. Yeah. I'm a bit of a Luddite here, and my panel with the questions on is right over the top of the plot. Let me let me get grizzly with the computer. Yeah, that's better, right? Uh, yeah, that's just bad. I think that's, ooh, but it does go, the points do go negative, don't they? Gosh. That, uh, I think what's probably happened, and you're absolutely right to pick it up, I suspect that's been centered at the mean value, of that okay. plot. So it's a very badly labeled yeah. plot, and I need marks, uh, absolutely. Suzanne, I don't know if you I want think to the Yeah, the labels are my, that's my fault. The, um, but you're right, the, what is zero on this plot, in essence, is, should say, sort of nine days, because the, uh, the mean was nine, so we've centred on nine. Um, yeah. yeah. When we did the modelling, so, yeah, that, I thought, yeah, well spotted, and that is my fault, yeah. I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry, Suzanne, full marks, Chris. <laughs> Thanks. And um, one final question came in from Christina. Um, do you need more data for this approach than the heuristic 10 data points? Uh, well, yeah, this, this is a really good question. Mm. And uh, one thing that I think has changed since I worked in this area 10, 15 years ago is that we tend to see bigger meta-analyses now. Um, and some of kind of the most interesting work I've done in this area has been when you have large data sets. I, I looked at a really valuable data set created by um, somebody on antidepressants uh, some years ago, and it was looking at the FDA data versus what was reported in journals, and it was a lot of the SSRI data, so there was, again, hundreds of trials. This is why I think this study is important um, that the Brett came to me with because you have, you have studies in the hundreds. As we do network mesh analyses, I think these things are more, uh, you're going to see more and more. So um, Suzanne's simulation will give some indication of, of the types of power you will get. Um, but we know that all the tests and everything like this are pretty, 10 is the absolute minimum and, and it, it really isn't very ideal and you'll, you'll see that. So it is definitely more the merrier here on this, and certainly uh, it, it would be better to have 20, 30 studies at least, I think. Mm.